The next section that we wanted to talk about is moving from routing to business policy based <coughs> networks. Okay? And I always go back to, there's a, a gentleman from years and years and years ago, uh, Bruce Krogh, who was a uh, Carnegie Mellon, he was my double E professor who taught me fundamentals of controls. And what he always told us is it's always easier to control something that you directly measure. Right? So when we look at networks and controlling application performance, I am going to go back to five or six years ago when I was an undergrad with Bruce Crowe and measure application performance directly. That was a joke, by the way. I have a little more gray hair than five or six years. <laughs> So now when we look at it, right, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, what are the top applications that networking teams ask with regards to applications? It used to be what applications are on my network. Not the case anymore. It's now what applications are my users and the people on my network running. Because a lot of those applications may be hosted in the cloud, but I'm still responsible for them, right? Which is an awesome position to be in. <laughs> Mine of business makes a purchasing decision, they deploy it. I'm responsible for the outcome, regardless of whether or not it was planned. Second question, okay, how are those applications performing? Right? My wife calls me and the network's broke. What does that mean? Then, most importantly, how are they supposed to perform? All of a sudden, I'm getting complaints. Okay, this isn't working as well as yesterday, or it's not working as good as tomorrow. I don't know what that means. Right? What is normal? How do we establish that application performance baseline? <coughs> very, very critical things. And that's where we have an opportunity here, right? And this is really a transformative event to, start, to stop thinking about packets at the overlay level and start thinking about application flows and sessions, okay? And I wanted to go real quick, real, real quick, because you guys know this better than me, um, packets versus flows versus sessions, just to make sure we're on the same page, right? Generally speaking, routers work at the packet level, statelets, limited set of attributes, um, it's always fun to do the, what I like to call the spray and pray model of packet forwarding and ensure symmetry, right? It's very, very difficult. It requires a lot of forethought and planning. Um, you can do application recognition, but it generally requires some level of DPI. It's coarse grain and it's usually uh, performance expensive because it's not a natural act for a router. You're, uh, you're smiling, uh, did I? Okay, <laughs> all right, I thought you had a question. But, you're, but you can also get a lot of, lot of rich data, yeah. uh, link level attributes, packet loss, jitter, bandwidth, so on and so forth. <coughs> now we move to flows. Unidirection, or there, it's a unidirectional st stream of packets. You have a much broader set of match criterias. You can do better application identification, but there isn't any cross-flow state symmetry, which makes it really difficult to get to kind of an application transaction level of granularity. So what we've done with our architecture is we've really moved to the session level, right? So we actually correlate, and a lot of times people will use session and flow interchangeably. That's why I wanted to go through a little bit of the, the discussion to, to, to show you what we're doing. We actually correlate multiple bi-direction flows on a per application basis. So when we do that, sy symmetry is now inherent to the application, right? We don't have to worry about different ways of hashing, uh, so on and so forth. We also get very, very granular application identification. <coughs> but we're also able now to do fingerprinting at the session level. So we're able to identify applications and things that are inherent to this session state, things like what the sub-app type is, codec, as well as application transaction time. And that session information, <coughs> that rich data, right, that's that datum that is used that we base all of our forwarding and our path selection decisions on, that we communicate to the controller to do baseline SLA determination, so on and so forth. That's why for us, and I think there were some articles written a few years ago with, um, with um, flow being the inner operation in the, um, in the SDN world, we really think there's an opportunity to take it to the flow comma session level for this very reason. So then you're, you're sticking a given application session or complete transaction to one that's symmetric right. path through the That's network right. between point A and point B. That's right. Okay. Okay. And what we're able to do now is, and I apologize, this is uh, not showing up on the screen. Um, I should have uh, uh, probably done a, a, a sanity check here. We're able to now look at the application transaction time, compare it to what is locally normal, right? 
because I ask anyone what the application SLA is supposed to be, how is it supposed to perform, they don't know. So we're, because we're actually capturing those, those sites, as they say, all politics is local, application performance is local as well. So we can give you a normative view of application performance and then tell you how it's comparing against that. And then the other thing that we can do is because we're looking at the session, we can decouple that for you in terms of the server side response for a network side response. And I'll leave it to you guys to, to answer in your, in your own minds why that is actually a useful piece of information. Incredible, okay? useful. <clears throat> we're also able, and, and I don't wanna miss this, is we're also able to decouple uh, media streams into different channels. We're able to <coughs> look at an Office 365 link session, <coughs> break it into the video session, the, the audio session, identify the codecs that are used, look at how the, the streams are performing against the codecs, and controlling them based upon their codec as specified requirements, right? So we're able to say this particular application is out of, out of codec compliance on this particular path for this particular set of attributes. For new flows, we'll put it on a different link. Are you doing HTTPS intercept or something? To be able to decouple things that you want to take is, that? isn't a very uh, very good question. Um, so no, so the answer is no. We're not we're not doing any actual HTTPS intercept and breaking <coughs> open the packets. We're able to do all of this via our app fingerprinting. We don't have to decrypt or get you know keys installed on us to be able to decrypt mm -hmm. the data to be able to do any of this. So there's no active intercept decryption. That at is all. correct. Okay. It was, yeah. Our entire fingerprinting system is all designed to make that not necessary. Some of them, some of us have been there, done that on yes. the app decryption side. Right. We don't want to go down that path again. That's that's a good choice. Okay. Yes. And do you do any um, traditional WAN optimization type stuff? Dedupe and compression. Yeah. But we what can. If, what if we had that in the network? It'll still work. It'll still work. Compatible. Coexistence. Coexistence. Yep. Okay. Coexistence. <laughs> Uh, the following question, uh, usually when I talk to customers, they say, okay, this is awesome, you can do this for you know, some predefined apps. What about custom apps? The answer is yes. The second uh, you sit down and define a custom app, we will start to automatically capture the transaction-specific SLA information, create those baselines, and then publish those uh, for use in path selection decisions to the endpoints, right? And it's gonna be one of those things where you'll converge upon what is good as everyone learns, but at least you have a seed point. How do you envision defining them? Is the user gonna have to fill out a form with ports and stuff like that? <coughs> or are they gonna be able to click on flows and say this, 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 and this? Or is there some easy way to define a custom app? Because what I'm seeing, the reason for the question is I'm That's seeing a lot fair. of people don't know what their apps do. Right. That's right. That's a great question, right? So then, uh, what? So, so which is why what we are seeing, and uh, even in real life deployments now, uh, really is that the discover mode alone, and the rich set of data that we're able to provide in the discover mode, where all the applications are getting identified, you're seeing the flows, you're seeing uh, even, even all the stats on which flows are the most interesting. Because in the end, uh, you know, when we move to an application-based management model for your network, you, you don't want to go and swat every application, right? In, in real life, you want to be you know, do, doing it at aggregates of uh, groups of applications. And what you want to very quickly know is which are the ones you really want to deal with. And, with creating uh, very granular policies on. And so that's where, you know, having the information of top talkers, what are my most critical applications, which are the ones that actually are, uh, you know, important to my business but suffering from performance. And then, uh, uh, you know, my expectation is that it's a very small number of distinct policies you'll have to go create in the network. You don't want to typically uh, get super granular with each and every one of your policies. Now, you do want to get sometimes granular, but in terms of the depth of the application itself, right? And I think uh, Vijay probably will uh, cover that, uh, where we, uh, you know, within an application from our system, we do have to get going to a certain level of granularity so that we're not just applying these policies on Office 365. Because what you're trying to do with Office 365, for instance, uh, is actually you're trying to work on SharePoint, you're trying to work on email, you're trying to work, you know, get a link uh, call established. And they're very, very different uh, applications, very different, uh, uh, you know, have very different performance characteristics on the network. And so we'll actually, uh, you know, show in a little bit uh, how we treat these things differently in an automated way by our system. Yes. So I assume, <clears throat> excuse me, and you, and you sort of touched on this a little bit before, but I assume since this can go on your, uh, you know, uh, customer-owned hardware, 
that some of the scaling issues of you know the amount of flows that can be monitored is going to be directly proportional yeah. to the amount of hardware you throw at it, right? That's right. Exactly. Um, right. Have, go ahead. No, I was going to ask uh, ask a follow on question, but go ahead. Um, so, like, say in a in a large campus environment where you see you know a huge amount of small flows, um, what what is the what's the expected do you have like a high ceiling that you, you know, uh, this is the maximum I think we can handle as far as number of flows and m megabits or gigabits per second? So the system itself uh, does, you know, uh, even in our own uh, testing does scale to several uh, gigs of uh, encrypted flow throughput. Okay. Uh, and it is horizontally scalable. Uh, so then you can keep padding uh, significant amounts of capacity horizontally too. Okay, so uh, if you've got n by yeah. one gig or n by whatever, you Th that's can exactly scale it. them out that's linearly. You, you can just scale out linearly. And the reason for really for adopting that kind of a model, if you see, uh, uh, and this will come up as a theme in multiple elements of our product architecture, mm -hmm. uh, that you know these are the learnings that I think uh, uh, for a lot of us from web scale architectures, right, yeah. where the old model of let's go build one large box versus if you can build a horizontally scalable model, it just affords greater flexibility for customers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And there's also a second thing that we've done on the data plane, right? So this isn't a packet data plane. There's a lot of optimizations that have been done to make it a session aware flow forward or what our data structures look like. How do we do the, the lookups against those data structures? How do we um, you know, do all of those things with a traditional packet based model? The more state that you maintain at the flow level, uh, very, very, very rapid trail off in performance. We're uh, much, much smoother there. All right, so you're, you're basically taking uh, some of what the old hardware appliance, uh, uh, security appliances, like say, you know, like an SRX or something that is a flow-based appliance, and you're using that same technology to use, or same methodology, I guess I should say, to make a more optimized lookup and use of uh, your resources that exist because it builds a flow, and then you can reference the flow instead of. I can't of speak to the, uh, the the other platform that you mentioned in terms of their architecture. But fundamentally, you're right. The the yeah. architecture of the data plane is really flow and session aware, okay. flow and session optimized. Okay. I, I got a question going back sure. to uh, custom. Sure, custom uh, apps. Yeah, custom apps being added. Um, do you use any of that data to provide policies for others? Like, do you use it to learn? Like, no. no. Okay. <laughs> That would be uh, that yeah. would be mean. What yeah. we're well, uh, what I, I we're able to <coughs> uh, is that uh, rather than uh, for for the uh, non-custom applications, right? For the more uh, because you know, like Vijay said, for custom applications, typically it's uh, you know you, it, it's a one-off for an organization. The organization has chosen to go build their own custom IT application. Mm -hmm. But when you go to uh, uh, package like SAP, ERP, my even my cloud-based applications, known applications, uh, we do shots. Uh, we, we know since we have the information, <coughs> what we're able to do is provide uh, provide baseline anonymized recommendations. Mm -hmm. Hey, in your peer uh, category, mm -hmm. here is what we typically see. So, uh, what it where it can help, and we're seeing that uh, from customers, really is that new, new new applications are constantly coming in, yeah. and IT teams are struggling to see. <coughs> right policy for this. Right. And if you've seen a new policy or you've seen some kind of a policy violation across uh, the customer base, this is just useful Market. information to propagate and provide as a suggestion. Yeah. But hey, if you are rolling out SAP and every one of your uh, uh, peer uh, companies, they have a segmented policy of a policy with a firewall uh, and you don't have one, you do get a noticing something for you to consider. Yeah, because what makes me think of that is, you know, like Cisco on the security side, will ask you when you set a box up yes. if you want to opt into their you know <coughs> information for anonymous information for global event correlation things like that and then they can use that to update things like IPS policies um, and you know they kind of use that to say hey we've we've got more data than anyone and we can put together accurate sure. policies and so on so it just made me think can that data be used to when new apps come out and you start yeah. to see a trend of that. In fact, it is, and it's particularly useful for SaaS-based apps as well as <coughs> traditional enterprise apps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. On that note, uh, we have another demo that yep. uh, uh, Mr. Edwards is going to uh, show for us. Hey, demo time. So my brain look at? melting. This is like melting my brain, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a big day. Uh, maybe we can... I have another question, but I don't know. Sure, go ahead. Okay. 
Um, <coughs> the question that kind of came in through Twitter. Uh, so if you guys are doing VXLAN and CAP, and then wrapping that in IPsec, then does that actually, what kind of implications does it have for hardware selection? Do you need something that can do VXLAN and CAP in, in hardware or anything like that? Or if you do this in software, what kind of overhead does that <coughs> add to, um, you know, to, to requirements for just a pure software? Play? So from a system sizing perspective, we don't need hardware to okay. support that because we're talking about on the VAN side, a few hundred megabits to a gigabit, it's okay. Um, I guess at the but, end of the day, you're probably doing a handful of so tunnels, for, not yeah, for, data center level overlay, yes. you know, hundreds of thousands of tunnels. So right? what is probably more relevant and important is the kind of the encryption that we got to do and sizing the system according to that. Mm -hmm. For the actual uh, VXL encapsulation stuff, it's uh, just another encapsulation on the, as the packet is moving through us. Yeah, this is the IPsec, but it's most of the overhead. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the, the fundamentally what you're seeing really is that in the van, right? I think it was mentioned earlier on that, you know, uh, the, the requirements we see from customers are gigs and tens of gigs, right? Which we absolutely and easily scale to. Uh, and that's where the opportunity for X, a transition to x86 really is, right? Uh, we certainly wouldn't recommend a customer to use an x86 based, uh, native switch in a, I don't know, 100 gig fabric in a data center, right? right? I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, merchant silicon, et cetera, you know, are considered, uh, commodity hardware. I think when it comes to the LAN, then the transition, you know, as not in, a, in the tens of gigs uh, across sites, that's, uh, I think it's, it's just providing a very interesting opportunity to make the transition to software. Definitely. Do you guys have like a, like a hardware compatibility list or something like that? <coughs> Customers that want to roll their own. That, that's it. That, that's exactly it. We are able to provide them, you know, that kind of a matrix and work with them to uh, make sure they don't shoot themselves in their foot. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Very kind of you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Great. All right. So, as you guys can see up there on the screen, we've got our CloudGenix dashboard set up. Um, and what we've got here, as VJ was saying, is we're going to take a look at some of our media analytics that we can provide. Um, we've got one site right now talking uh, out to the cloud. Uh, so this is actually back at our headquarters again. Um, and we've got an active WebEx and a couple other meetings going on. Uh, and so we're going to dive in and see what we can see uh, from the, our actual real-time analytics. Let me zoom in a little bit. Last hour, so it gets a little granular. I'm going to try to break it down into the different paths being taken. Yep. All right, and you can see for right now, uh, we've decided that our private WAN going through our data center is actually getting the best performance for WebEx. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing that, uh, let's actually jump into an app. Since I know what, the, what we're actually doing, I'm not going to hit top 10, I'm just going to hit the app and go right to it. And that's interesting, it's very browser-based, so there's a whole category of so yeah. Office 365, it'll show you all of the sub apps that you could dive into individually as well. Right. Yep. I'm having the reaction that your uh, list of apps looks like a periodic table. Of it does. It does very, very. <laughs> <laughs> Some more radioactive than others. <laughs> Ion, elements, mm -hmm. genetics, genetics, so on and so forth. Yep, yep. There was a question early on about, uh, I think Stephen asked us uh, early on, on uh, you know, a little bit on the naming of the company and how it is CloudGenix. So the ION and the, uh, uh, fundamentally we do think that uh, we are trying, you know, making our little attempt to change the DNA of networking. Uh, so that rather than dealing with packets, we really start dealing with application flows and application sessions. Get a little bit more here. We can see what our, our video bandwidth is. So right now we've got we've had an ongoing session most of the day, um, just to have some traffic, making sure we got going on uh, with WebEx. And uh, right now it's going through the private WAN, and we can see that our video bandwidth is about 300k. It drops down when idle. Um, and we've actually got the cameras in our uh, one of our one of our people using our iPads in our in our um, uh, lab room, and the other one's using it out in the office where everybody's at. You can see the audio is using a different level of bandwidth than the video is using. Jitter, jitter and uh, characteristics are, sit, are close. You can see that the audio jitter and the video jitter were close, but there is definitely a difference of things. For example, you can see when the video went down, the video jitter also went down. So there's a lot of information that we can glean from this, you know, being able to pull it out of our API. And yeah, unfortunately, I can't show any packet loss. We've had good packets going through. We will, we'll shoot and do some latency later on when we're doing uh, one of the other demos, and we'll be able to see that coming in as well. <coughs> 